Trouble. I'm going to be talking about the evolution of the 96 boards ecosystem and future software enablement. Uh, who's here familiar with the 96 boards brand name? Yeah. All right, cool. Good to know. Uh, yeah, so we're going to talk just a little bit about that. I'm going to offer some resources, some URLs if you want to read more about that. But uh, 96 boards ecosystem. Here we go. Me. My name is Robert Wolf. Like I just said, I'm an engineer, community manager for 96 boards, which is a part of Lenaro. And for those of you who aren't, aren't, aren't you know, familiar with Lenaro, there will be a slide here with some links as well. You can also just search Lenaro, go to lenaro.org. There's some more kind of just personal information about myself, university in San Diego. I flew all the way here to talk to you all for 25 minutes. So from San Diego, please, I want this to be very informal. If anyone has questions, you want to interrupt me, please do so. Uh, you know, this is hopefully a conversation. And then when I leave, which is tomorrow, you can always reach me on Twitter, Instagram, IRC, those are the three channels that I'm usually in. I'm also in the Fedora Flock channel, Fedora IoT channel, I'm in several other Fedora channels. Fedora Arm channel. Fedora Arm channel, yeah, I'm in a bunch of Fedora channels as well. And then my GitHub is right there as well, along with my email. So today's topics. I'm going to talk just a little bit about Lenaro, a little bit about 96 boards. I'm gonna talk about the community, because I'm the community manager for 96 boards kind of give you a little bit of an insight of, of kind of what our reach is, what we do in general, and then I will talk about or have a conversation hopefully with everyone about the future of the software enablement on our 96 boards with Fedora. So what is Lenaro and 96 boards? Lenaro was founded in 2010 and the goal is to basically reduce the redundancies and fragmentation in the ARM ecosystem around everything in the ARM ecosystem, I guess I should say. Now, I want to share a small anecdote. I'm not sure who's familiar, but um, SoftBank did recently acquire ARM for $32 billion. The CEO must have seen something big, right, to spend that much money on ARM, $32 billion. Uh, so currently, you have about 100 billion devices out there running ARM, okay? CEO thinks that that's going to hit up to a trillion. Even if even if it doesn't reach trillion, even if it only reads half a, half a trillion, right? you know, 500 billion, we're still talking about a bunch of devices out there running ARM. And even today's keynote, I guess in the, in the morning when Matthew was talking about how we're starting to see this plateau in Fedora, we want to increase those numbers, right? We want to increase our contributors, we want to increase these devices that are out there pinging the servers and up just the numbers in general, right? So I mean, this is definitely something that should interest everyone here that's that's you know in the Fedora world. And if you want to learn more again, like I said, please feel free to visit those websites and learn more about Lenaro. 96 boards was founded quite later, and the goal originally was to provide cost effective or you know low cost hardware, ARM hardware, for developers like you all to to kind of fiddle with and play around with to develop ARM, make it better. Now since then, we have pushed out a whole bunch of devices. We pair up vendors, chip vendors, we pair them up with manufacturers, distributors, and try to do our best to make sure that they follow this ARM specification. And right now I want to kind of take a little bit of the, what is it, order of operations and break down what we consider the 96 board specification. It is an open hardware specification. A lot of people think open hardware, comma, specification, but it's actually an open hardware specification which means the specification itself is open, not the hardware, not necessarily all the time. And so that being said, we'll talk about this later when it comes to, uh, when it comes to the uh, software enablement, uh, this has kind of brought in some problems that we're going to try and tackle. But yes, again, there you go. There's some more resources around 96 boards. And for those of you who would like to read more, it's not the whole point of this talk to talk all about 96 boards in this sense. So I'll just kind of leave that there with you to read more about. Now, talking a little bit more about this hardware and the specification, you can see that we've pushed out various devices, and many of you who have said you've heard about 96 boards might be familiar more so with the consumer edition side of things. I know Peter in the audience, Rob in the audience, uh, many, many have been playing around with the Dragon Board 410C, the High Key, um, and all of these are different SOCs uh, that, le that lay on the same footprint. So this is kind of what makes the, the 96 boards ecosystem so attractive to people who are developing. And someone I think in the audience during Peter's conversation was talking about IoT and sensors and, and all these other kind of 
at this other kind of enablement that you might want around IoT. And with that regard, I mean, here, so here we're looking at 964 is the same footprint right over here. The um, Enterprise Edition right here that you might see the same footprint. And then the TV based off the Enterprise Edition, Extended CE Edition, which should also work within the same kind of footprint compounds. And then an IoT Edition over here, right? But with having the same footprint and having it be SOC independent, uh, you open up opportunities for the market of mezzanines, or what we call mezzanines, so what Raspberry Pi might call hats and Arduinos might call shields. We call them mezzanines, and these boards um, have been coming out of the woodworks. Quite literally, uh, they just keep coming out, and I can't even keep track of them. You know, there's, there's all sorts of companies that have just come, come out and released. I'm just gonna talk quickly about this one right here. There was a university up in San Francisco that needed a camera, and they couldn't figure out how to use it on the Dragon Board 410C, so then they just developed this board all by themselves, printed it out, and then they started selling it on eBay. It just popped up on eBay one day. I was like, okay, great, yeah, now we can use cameras on all these different 96 boards. They're still working on uh, submitting drivers and doing all sorts of cool stuff with this. You can literally go to eBay and buy that right now. Why do I say this? Well, because right now, Fedora really isn't running on our devices. And if it were, people would have access to- Get in there. Get, get in, in there. there. If it was, <laughs> and we're gonna talk about this too, but if it was, then people would have access to a plethora of IO and a plethora of, or a very vibrant ecosystem that, that's continued to grow faster than I can even keep track of. So this is the mezzanine page right here. And you, know, you can go to 96words.org, you can read all about all these little devices here for the most part. Any questions so far? Uh, 96 boards, the specifications, mezzanine, no? Sir, sir. So why did you not put any spy flash or something on the boards as part of the specification? Boom, that's that's actually one of the last slides that we're gonna be talking about. We can talk about it right now a little bit, Peter, you wanna? Yeah, so one of the roles that I've picked up is that I actually sit on the 96 board steering committee. And one of the first things that I engaged with them about was flash on board for firmware and, and such stuff. And the intention I understand is that for version two of the CE and other specs that are due out shortly, there will be that requirement there. Yeah, so Peter does sit on the steering committee on behalf of, I believe, Red Hat, Fedora. So yeah, Red Hat as a whole, but Fedora, RHEL, CentOS. And, and so this is only recently that, that kind of Peter started sitting on the steering committee. We've had several meetings and the specification 2.0 is in the making, right? And this will of course be proposed to the steering committee. Uh, we have meetings I think once a month or so and hopefully this will move forward and that is particularly something we're trying to address. Uh, that, that's, to me that's the quickest thing with trying to use any of the boards is getting the bootloader and the firmware in place to make it move. So in case any of my supervisors are watching, they're saying, SPI flash on the specification. Okay, I'm not that. Yeah. <laughs> critical. <laughs> critical. Okay. It's critical, critical to get that added to the specification. This is what this is what we're hearing at Fedora Flock 2017. Thank you. Um, did you have a question, sir? Me? Yes. Whether it's I should wait until the end to see if you cover it. Okay, all right, perfect. So the whole point of me kind of talking a bit about the community, first of all, obviously I'm the community manager, but I wanted to kind of give an idea to everyone about what our reach is, kind of what our goals and what our reach is and why it's important for Fedora to be a part of this as a whole, right? Uh, personally, I have been trying to create a community from, I want to almost say scratch, uh, to uh, that, that's, that kind of banks ourselves on an organic growth. We have very strong engagement from our people uh, I want to make sure that anyone who talks to me or the you know involved community feels that they're being listened to. So there's an active give and take. And I promise that that is what will happen. Uh, interactive improvement. And like I said, you know, this active listening will feed into a very interactive improvement, give and take. Once again, we want to make sure that we're doing what what is best and that it's being pushed forward as a community. And then, of course, there's always new initiatives and new things that kind of float into my head or the community's head every now and then and we try to you know make them happen right and this will hopefully feed into everything that is above 
what is the reach that we have here at 96 Sports? We participate with many huge companies. I mean, this includes Arm, Qualcomm, Huawei, High Silicon, many distributors, Aero, and the list goes on. If you want to go to the Lenaro website, 96 Sports website, you can see all of our partners. There's a lot of people that want to be involved with this movement. And with that comes a lot of visibility. We participate in hackathons. Uh, uh, we just recently got uh, accepted with Qualcomm into the Major League Hackathons, which is a global initiative uh, where 96 boards will be present at every single one of these hackathons. Uh, they will have access to all the operating systems that come with these 96 boards. And people, kids, students, all walks of life will be working on these boards. Lots of visibility worldwide. Academics. I personally work with several universities in the United States, in Brazil, in Mexico, hopefully soon to be China and India, and these are all professors, faculty, uh, that want to get 96 boards into the university classrooms. This is a really big deal, and uh, we are trying to move forward with this quickly and also efficiently. Conferences and workshops, you know, right here, this is an example of uh, being at a conference, hopefully spreading the 96 boards word creating evangelists and having fun together, workshops. Um, I've given several workshops. Other people give lots of good workshops. And uh, yeah, it's another good reason. But yeah, then the list goes on, right? Lenaro Connect, for those of you who aren't familiar with Lenaro Connect, I think it's connect.lenaro.org, I think. You can search for that. Um, it's a conference that we do twice a year. Uh, you get leading industry professionals in this world uh, from all over the world that show up in one place, similar to Fedora Flock, actually. And uh, it's all about collaboration and, and talking business and talking community. And so that's a lot of fun. It happens twice a year. This time it's going to be in San Francisco next month. So for those of you who are interested, social media, and then again, initiatives. So for those of you who feel like following, you can go search 96 Sports all over the place. What are some of the initiatives that I have been working on personally right now? Again, this is just to kind of build up the reach, but Open Hours, for those of you who aren't familiar with Open Hours, I host a live podcast. It's a video stream that happens every week at Thursday, on Thursday at 4 p.m. Peter was actually just on there. I have a picture of Peter smiling on the show. You're going to probably see this. But, but yeah, so Open Hours is an awesome initiative. If you ever have any questions, you want to just come and you know talk, vent, uh, get involved in the community in any way, you can join this call. It's 96boards.org forward slash Open Hours. And that happens every Thursday. It'll happen this Thursday. Thursdays at noon here. Noon East Coast, yes. 4 p.m. UTC, that's unchanging. Uh, projects and projects pages, websites, documentation. Uh, our whole website now is back rendered from GitHub. So our website, our documentation, everything, this is community driven. If you want to change something on our website, submit it. Gatekeeper will review it and maybe you know our website gets changed. But everything is interactive now. This is just an example of one of the Open Hours episodes here. This is a Brazilian partnership that we got involved in. These are all folks from Brazil. They went into a hackathon. It was an internet or a national hackathon in Brazil. They all won. They flew up to San Diego. We took over the Qualcomm Think of It Lab, and uh, we all did a, a nice show there. It was a lot of fun. Um, all these folks are from different companies all around Brazil. They all made really cool projects, and they will all be visible uh, through Qualcomm and 96 Sports. Here's another show we did with Monero and Cobri. Uh, if you're not familiar with the cryptocurrency Monero, uh, it's rumored that, and I'm, I'm not saying that this really happened, but um, the, the day after this show, their, their whole value of Monero went up like 300%. It was crazy. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I, I, I talked to the lead devs, which is Ricardo, um, HYC, Justin, he's also involved there. Um, you know, they, I don't know if they're going to say it was because of the show, but um, I did notice that. It was pretty cool. And then here's Peter. Happy Peter. Um, he was talking about Fedora, and of course, um, as he mentioned, soon we hope to have Fedora running on our 96 boards, right? And uh, it is mostly there. In fact, it, it runs on the high key. Um, it's being polished to come to my talk tomorrow, and you'll hear more about it. Boom, there you go. Peter, stop. Some of the projects that people are getting involved in, these are all community driven projects. None of these were done by people at 96 boards. As far as I know, none of them, no one was paid to do these. These are just projects that are surfacing people that are getting involved in this ecosystem. Now the big talk, software enablement. So this is where kind of I'm done, right? This is more of a discussion. I want to talk about two things. First is early access hardware. This is kind of the easy part, right? So I'm dealing with all of these companies, like I said, the chip makers that put their chips on the, the boards, they get with the manufacturers, and they get with the distributors, and they all 
send these boards out, I've kind of come across a lot of problems here because either the boards sell out too quickly, in which case the people who are supposed to have these boards don't get their hands on them in time, or they just, or, yeah, that's actually pretty much it. They just sell out too quickly or they don't make enough, yeah. So early access hardware is what I'm trying to work with our distributors with. Uh, they're gonna create pockets of boards, and so that way I can talk with Peter, uh, who's kind of representing you all here. Uh, if you need a board, if you feel like contributing, if you feel like being a part of this, then please contact Peter. Peter can reach out to me and we will get this hardware in your hands as quickly as possible. Is that okay with you, Peter? Yep. Awesome. And then the next is standards and compliance. What 96 Boards does for you to use the 96 Boards name is your board goes through a series of compliance checks. Now, in the past, it's possible that certain compliance has been slightly lenient. Uh, we plan on adjusting these standards and being more strict on compliance. This will, of course, help anyone who's in the process of enabling software, anyone who wants to be in this ecosystem and work on this type of stuff uh, to, to, you know, do it easier, do it better. And that's the whole idea. Now, with regards to the standards, this is kind of what I'm calling the specification. What are the standards that we need to enforce? And that is the specification. Peter, who sits on the, on the steering committee, uh, along with many others who are involved uh, in, in software enablement as well, I won't name any other companies, but they also, I'm sure, would love this to happen. And so, uh, you know, let's talk about getting the SPI flash on there. Let's talk about, you know, getting the, the members or the partners that are releasing these chips to get, to, to focus more on UEFI, to focus on U-Boot. Let's get these, th let's get everything more unified, right? And that's kind of the goal. And so that's, that's kind of all I have here. Um, we're hoping that this will start to show uh, uh, movement really soon, uh, within the next few months, within the next six months. I, we're gonna have some big meetings next month in Connect uh, in San Francisco, so I'm sure that we'll start seeing a lot of this move forward. And that's it. So in, in the standards, is there any requirements that the vendors upstream support for their code? Like in the kernel, in u wherever? So, you so the question is: Is there any spe is there anything that forces the vendors to submit upstream to? So yes, I want to say yes and no. Um, so there's two components to that because the standard itself is actually a hardware standard, so it doesn't actually cover the software side of it at all. Yeah. So th while while I would say yes and no is is only because they don't want to release a crappy board, right? No one wants to release something that no one's going to use, at, at which point Lenaro and 96 boards offer a big amount of guidance, right? And then we also offer various levels of support. So for vendors or members, partners who are interested in getting involved in this upstream process, which in my opinion has a very high learning curve and also requires certain reputation to get involved, um, you can actually work with Lenaro and do and, and get involved in that. However, yes, it's not as enforced as I think I would like it to be. So this is also one of the things that I've also been leading as part of the steering committee. Um, it's certainly not just me, but it, like if you look at the original Hikey when it was released, there was no source code for it upstream. If you look at the Hikey 960, it's pretty much all upstream already. Um, and it's only sort of just been out a little while. So the 96 boards guys certainly weren't that good to start with, but you know, it's been a learning curve for them as well. Um, and like the Dragon board now is pretty much all upstream and we've been working with Qualcomm to sort out the firmware redistribution issues <laughs> and a bunch of those firmwares landed into uh, the Linux firmware stuff now, so that's starting to become less of a problem and Qualcomm is very aware of that and so is dealing with that earlier rather than later with their legal teams. Um, it's, it's a learning curve and it's getting better. Like, with, we should have two of the 96 boards supported in Fedora 27. Um, there's no way we could have done that two years ago. So. Is there much required outside of you know, 
since we're rebasing kernels anyway, doesn't that mean that eventually 26 will be able to run those same boards, or is it is there more user space that has to support them as well? Uh, no, in theory 26 should be able to, but then we then have to regenerate the images and they have to go through QA, um, and I personally don't have enough time to oh, do that. I didn't mean like us spin new images, I was just saying. Yes. Do it like so I'll throw a card over. Oh, yeah, yeah. So similarly related to that, you talked about open hardware specification versus open hardware specification. On the other hand, then when you say choose GPUs to have in there that don't have um, open source components, I'm not going to use names here, it makes it really hard as a developer or current developer to want to be able to do anything like that. Is there any influence, influence to say, if we're going to be in the pure open source spirit, we need to be able to we have something that has a Workable graphics stack to be able to do what you want. Is that just at all possible? I mean, I understand the committee for this again. Uh, hardware specification, on the other hand, can't ignore the software ecosystem as well. Absolutely. Did you want to say anything to that, Peter? No, I'm leaving that one to you. Yeah, that's, <laughs> so this is a tough one. So this is a tough one, right? Because like you just said, it's a specification, and in a lot of cases we have already seen, and again, I won't say any names, but we've seen boards come out that just call themselves 96 boards because they just have access to the specification, they didn't go through any compliance test, they didn't contact us in some cases, and then we now have to reach out and get this process rolling, right? So sometimes it's too late, and we didn't have an opportunity to, to give them these recommendations or push them in this direction. Now can we enforce this to happen? I wanna say no. I don't think that we can absolutely enforce it. Um, I'm sorry? Well, for that example that I just kind of gave right now, so like we can't absolutely enforce it, but this is something also that maybe Peter and I can bring up in a steering but committee meeting and, and, and start moving forward on, right? Because this is a committee, it's something that's driven by the community itself. It, it is, I mean, you, you have a trademark though, right? It's, it's kind of like with Fedora. Anybody can do a Fedora spin if they want to, but they can't call it Fedora and use our trademarks unless it meets certain requirements. Yes. So. Yeah, like I can make a 96 right board. Now, like <laughs> oh, no, but I, I can make a 96 board, but I can't call it a 96 board unless I've gone through this process or I'm opening it. I would assume. I mean, this is, I'm certainly not a lawyer. And no, you're right. That, that would remain. require, like, you know, a little bit more legal attention. Yeah. 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 But, Robert, I, I think one of the keys is that we're, I work for Lenaro, so, so I'm, we are a software company. We're not trying to be a hardware company. It's a hardware spec that we've come up with to basically support the software community. So we, we, we invest, not just Robert, but we have a lot of our greatest software people working with the 96 boards to try to do, so do the, better. Right, but the problem is that you end up with hardware blocks that say there aren't actually open specifications there that you fundamentally can't really do a whole lot. So this is a, this is a good point though, like what Mike just said right now, is that you know it's hard for us to enforce all of these things because we're not a hardware company, we are a software company at, at, at its core, right? So at the end of the day, if a board doesn't want to be successful, then they will probably do those things. If a board wants to be successful, then they will do the right thing. And they'll open as much as possible. And that's something that we can't control. However, we can push our recommendations on them and we'll try our best, but you're going to have 96 boards that are more prominent in the ecosystem and you're going to have 96 boards that are less prominent. And I mean, in in the GPU stuff, like if I go back five years, there was literally no open source um, accelerated GPUs. And now, like from my slide deck for tomorrow, um, there's we've got four or five that are supported. And in the 96 boards case, Qualcomm Dragon Board one is probably one of the success stories there. Thank you, Rob, uh, with regards to the free Drino driver. Um, the certain other major key manufacturer that sells display IP that they haven't opened up, well, it's, which is shipped on a couple of the other 96 board platforms, um, is, I mean, ultimately they're getting beaten from every side in the open source community about it, and, and they're still not, and there's not a lot unless we get someone like Rob that reverse engineers it and, you know, and at the last Connect there was discussions about that and 
that closed source blobs are a bit easier to use with Wayland, which means we could probably use them in RPM Fusion with less stress, similar to the NVIDIA like binary blobs for x86, um, which is not ideal by any stretch of the imagination. Like I would just like another, I'd like to clone Rob three or four times to deal with that other problem. But but it not not in that particular vendor's case, but there's other situations where like the Etnaviv and the Free Drino driver, um, Broadcom finally got the message with the Raspberry Pi with the VC4 driver. Um, so the ecosystem there is slowly improving. Um, I'm kind of looking on with interest from um, Imagination, which open, owns the Power VR um, stuff, given that they've now lost Apple as a customer, and, and suddenly, like, maybe they will start to care about Linux, just simply because it, it, it then becomes a key part of their revenue because they don't have the cash cow that is Apple. Um, yeah, it, it's hard. It, it has got better. It has got better, except for one or two particular vendors where they've been uh, decidedly stubborn. So, so yes, both of you. I write right, right, Chris. You, sir. Yeah, no, you. I think probably easier just to say that uh, you could tighten the specification down in that way, but then there would be a lot fewer boards that actually were 96 boards because. You have to control the spec, but you can't control what hardware manufacturers do. So, yeah, and this kind of stuff comes up quite often. Um, you have to be very delicate with the specification, especially when there's so many people sitting and giving their their opinions during these meetings. Right? You have to be delicate, and you have to be kind of I don't want to say slow moving, but something that, for instance, starts off as optional in the specification might then become recommended in the second one. And then by the third one, it'll be an, an absolute enforced part, right? So that these boards continue to roll out and you keep everyone kind of happy. So maybe this type of thing becomes something that's optional right now, but recommended in the next spec, while then in 3.0, it becomes absolutely enforced, required, basically. So. If I was there two and a half years ago when all this started, it has come a long way. No, good, good, good to hear. Thank you. I mean, the whole idea just literally came to try to empower our own developers. Our great relationship with ARM, we couldn't get the high-powered 64-bit boards ourselves at a, at a reasonable cost. So that's where it came, and then just started sharing. Robert and others have done a tremendous job of spreading the word. Yeah, lead, lead times, a long time ago, lead times cost is, is huge. I mean, now you can get your hands on boards for $75. IK 960 is two hundred fifty nine dollars. You know that's cost per for the board. That's that's pretty pretty decent. I mean, or with most distros are supporting our, our ARM V8 and that, that kind of thing with proper servers. But the only things that's that I can see in in my price range are toy systems, if you will. Ninety six board is no different than anyone else, other than just being more open and use and things that people can implement. I'm stuck with two or four gigs of RAM, ports all around the edges and whatnot. I know how to build a computer, but where, or where's the where's the interest in making something I can do that? So, are you talking about along the lines of de developing something, or you know, contributing to something like Fedora? Are you talking about developing a product and actually creating something to sell? I, well, if so, if I want to if I want to help uh, or help Arch or Arch sixty four or those kinds of things along, I'm stuck with. I'm stuck with low power, really tiny or tiny systems, and even or even 96 or you know, 96 uh, EE thing is a or is a custom form factor, is a small system and, and whatnot. It's not something bigger like the, or like the PCI using an AMD 64. My, my point, yes. Yeah. So you're talking about getting something more powerful, kind of like a laptop machine, something that you can develop on. This. I, I want an equivalent to my workstation. Yes, okay, so. so. So where's the interest in that? Yes. So Linus Torvalds at two connects ago said basically exactly the same thing. That he basically wants a Mac style device that he can compile a kernel on at full speed. Right. Um, where probably a third generation ARM V8 actual silicon at the moment 
And so speeds are going up, prices are coming down. Um, I don't know about unreleased products, but looking at some of the SACs that are coming down the line, um, I suspect you'll start to see that in the coming month. I'm, I'm more thinking, I, I would like something I can put in a, sta or in a standard key key yes, for like it once again. Yeah. yeah, mini ATX, micro ATX, that sort of thing. Um, and, and like the 96 board EE has a micro ATX, mini ATX option as part of the spec. Uh, is anyone actually building those? Uh, not that I've seen released. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, all I can say with regards to that is, stay tuned. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, like Peter said, might see something in the next few months. It's, it's, uh, it is definitely of high interest. So, you know, like I've heard watched. rumors. I've, I've not seen any product announcements yet. Um, but you know, the chips are becoming more widely available. I mean, they've been talking about SBSA compliant servers that are of high spec for. Uh, well, Mr. Masters has been talking about it for five years, and real, and you you can now finally like buy decent spec servers that are doing that. Um, you know, I've been wanting them for Fedora infrastructure for five years, and, and you know they're finally starting to get there. So the servers are there now, and then you know ultimately the prices will start to come down, and you know you'll start to see more competition on the market and stuff like that. So. I'm sure, and given that Linus has said, like, if Arm wants to be successful, um, they need to start producing devices like this. The Windows 10 laptop, which is a Qualcomm 835, is a really, really nice SOC. And I know it runs UEFI out of the box, but if it's anything like the last Microsoft attempt at Arm, they use Secure Boot to lock it down to only boot Microsoft OSs. Mm -hmm. I've been poking around trying to get an answer to see whether that would be the case this time as well. I've not managed to get an answer from anyone yet, but you know, there's like, so the Qualcomm 835 with UEFI would be an awesome 96 board, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. <laughs> um, because you know, that that is like, you know, equivalent of current gen Intel spec with really nice graphics and you know functionality and USB-C and all of that sort of stuff that you want in a modern day laptop. Um, in theory at a reasonable price, um, it's whether like those vendors can do, you know, non completely locked down Microsoft editions of them. Yeah, no folks, thank you very much. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Uh, you know, my <laughs>